family, it's time for a true look at your world. <laughs> Let's get hooked up for Pack Therapy. Here's your hosts, Tim Donnelly and Graham Hill. Welcome back into another edition of Pack Therapy, the podcast. I'm Tim Donnelly, as always, joined by Graham Hill. This week, or, or this episode, I should say, joined by Corey Smith, editor, Pack Pride. You can follow him on, on Twitter or, or X, whatever you call it, uh, at R. Corey Smith. Uh, we appreciate him uh, joining us. Before we bring on Corey, though, and, and, and get his thoughts on, on the Pack basketball season, uh, please like and subscribe everywhere. This, uh, this can be found. It's it's everywhere that a podcast can be found. Obviously, if you're listening, you found it, uh, but pass it along to your friends. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, Corey, I hope you hear the, the sarcasm in my voice uh, when I say this one to, to start things off. Are you as appalled by, by DJ Horn's double birds as, as everybody seems to be appalled by uh, DJ Horn's double birds? I was just absolutely in shock. No, it's, <laughs> I mean, you know, look, he's a college kid. Like, I think people forget that sometimes. It's like, He's thinking that it's he's just making a joke. Uh, I, I think we all kind of forget, like, you know, you're not used to being uh, having a camera on you 24-7. So, like, the entire time that you're playing a game, there's going to be, if you do something, it's going to be caught. If you're DJ Burns and you're running to the, you know, uh, to the tunnel and you start throwing up, yeah, guess what? That's probably going to get caught somehow. <laughs> uh, people are going to see that. So, Everything you do is going to be amplified, and, and I just, you know, hey, he, he saw him walking away, saw his back turn, and, and thought it was, it was going to be funny, and, and it was hilarious, uh, but we'll see you know, if there are any actual repercussions. I, I still i am not sure what the reprimand was from the ACC. A, a reprimand is, is we've dealt with it and we're moving on. That's how I took it. it it's almost like, don't ask us about it again, but yeah. what, what are you going to do for the, the double low birds when, when a ref is walking away? I thought it was hilarious. Corey, I'm glad you brought up DJ Burns. Yeah, well, I'm not glad you brought it up, but I'm glad you mentioned DJ Burns <laughs> getting sick in the hallway. I just kind of want to go back to how strange of a game that was against Wake Forest between Burns, obviously, getting sick in the hallway, and then the double birds by DJ Horn, and then also uh, Middlebrooks and Diara also getting technicals and joining Kevin Keats in the locker room. Kevin Keats said in the postgame pe- press conference he was trying to figure out why so many players were joining him before the game was even over. Is this one of the more stranger NC State basketball games that we just witnessed this past Tuesday? Yeah, I mean, definitely. It was It was also It was also one that kind of unlocked some other things that, that I don't think Kevin Keats or the assistants knew about this roster. I mean, you know, you see what but Ben Middlebrooks and, and Mo Diara were able to do. Uh, you saw that lineup of, I think it was DJ Horn, uh, Mo Diara, Ben Middlebrooks, and then you had like Dennis Parker. And there was just no, there was no weaknesses in, in the end of game situation there. And I think that's what led to uh, NC State being able to not only get stops on the defensive end, but on the offensive end, uh, being able to get easy buckets. And, and I think despite the fact that you lost your head coach early on, uh, you lose, you know, one of your more productive players uh, midway through the second half. Uh, it's still, you know, NC State's resiliency and you see the, you know, the guys around them uh, kind of pick up the slack. And, and despite the fact that, you know, you mentioned obviously losing Mo Diara and losing Ben Middlebrooks uh, there at the end of game situation, it's 48 seconds left. So you're able to kind of figure it out from there, but, uh, you figured out a lot more about this team and and some of the depth that you have uh, and some of the guys in the way that they're able to kind of carry the team as opposed to being looked at as, you know, just bench players that can help you every once in a while. What did that game mean for Keats, though? Because you know, there, there was starting to be this, this like, rumbling of, uh, you know, he's not Doran, and Doran plays into the NC State kind of, I don't ego or pathos or what I don't know all the villain. The, the, the salty Dave, right? And salty Dave was a thing. Felt like Keats was like people like that. Oh, okay. Well, watch what I can do. I'm gonna get ejected. I'm, I'm after the game. I'm gonna be, uh, you know, not apologizing for the things that that maybe we crossed the line on. What, what did that game do for Keats? Uh, you know, in the midst of a nice run to start ACC play, but really it, as far as maybe endearing him to some fans that he hadn't been endeared to yet over the length of his, his tenure. Yeah. He's still going to work, workshop some names. I don't know exactly what uh, his salty Dave persona would be. Maybe saucy Keats or I don't saucy. know. Like he, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, salsa like was pretty. It was a pretty good term for him. I mean, he's he's just a very he's much more upbeat personality mm -hmm. than Dave is. Uh, when Dave says things, you're just like, oh wow, it takes you back. Uh, for for Kevin, he laughs through it. You know, it's like even the way he's saying it, he kind of you know at the very end of game, uh, the end of the press conference, you know, he threw out some some choice words and then you know the things that he said. You kind of still go, oh man, that's you know it was funny the way that he did it, as opposed to you know just being kind of like a off-putting thing sometimes from from Dave. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think not only the fact that he you know acted the way that he did and he, he reacted, uh, it you know that per showing that personality helps a lot with the NC State fan base because there's been people that have been asking for it all year long and asking for it throughout his tenure, like. Who, you know, where, where is the personality? Who is this type of coach? Who is he? Uh, and he showed a little bit of that, but also, you know, getting the win the way that they did, um, him kind of igniting the team, despite the fact that they get four technical foul free throws and then get possession and score uh, easily. That's kind of a six point swing, but it lit a fire under his team. It also proved a little bit more about you know, how good these assistants are. Guys like Joel Justice. Uh, you know, that that steps up and Kareem Richardson steps up as the head coach uh, in, you know, on the bench for, for the game. Uh, and Levi Watkins, the way they were able to lead the team. Uh, and, and it shows, you know, just just how good of a staff he is. He has around him. So it showed a lot of things for Kevin Keats, but it also showed a lot of things about the program that he's built uh, and where this team can be, too. How real is this team? Five five and one in the ACC looks fantastic on paper, but the more you dig in, it's like, all right, well, maybe the strength of schedule isn't there. You, you, if I hear the words quad one wins one more time, I mean, we, we, we talk quads and, and, I don't know, glutes and anything else we, we can we can talk about. Uh, how real is this team, or, or do we even have the opportunity to know that? I mean, I don't think we really know just yet, uh, you know, and that, that sounds crazy to say, and it's – I'm saying exactly what Keats uh, pointed out the other night. He was pissed off at people for saying, hey, you know, you don't know about the toughness of this team or, you know, we, we don't get the team doesn't get any respect despite the fact that they're five and one and, uh, you know, all these different things. Well, OK, but, you know, Wake Forest is the first good team in conference play, I would say, that they've beaten. Uh, Boston College, you can make the argument, but Boston College is is virtually one one and a half players. Uh, one and a half good ACC players that you're you're having to take down. Quentin Post, one of the best in the ACC, but still uh, not a not a great team, not a great environment that you went into and won. Uh, so really, those are the two major ones that you've won. All of the opportunities you've had so far, you know, the good opportunities you've had against good quality teams, you've lost. Now, granted, all four of those teams are in the top 25. Ole Miss, you know, the lowest amongst them at 22. Uh, so we'll find out a lot more about who this team truly is over the coming weeks, though, because, you know, they're going to have Virginia Tech coming in this weekend. Virginia Tech, not a great team, but has some really good players that if they get hot uh, can can put you away. Uh, Virginia, not a great team, but Virginia at home, they're going to face next week on the 24th. Uh, that team, you know, 20 straight at home now, uh, the longest streak in the NCAA uh, and the, the next home game they're going to have is against NC State, so they're going to try to push it to 21. And then you have teams like Miami, uh, and then once you get into February, you're going to start the Dukes and the UNCs over again. So uh, we'll see what this team is capable of in the next coming weeks. But, yeah, I mean, this is a this is a, a, a team that has a chance to finish above 500 in ACC play, and everybody's just kind of like, yeah, but we're, we're going to see what they're capable of uh, eventually, right? How frustrating, how crazy is it that they could legitimately be like seven or eight and one in the ACC and we're going to be going, well, they still haven't played anyone. Like I can't imagine playing nine games in the ACC and still not know about a team. It's supposed to be a meat grinder. Yeah, I mean, look, we're finding out a lot about the team. Like I'm not saying that uh, they're not good enough to get to the NCAA tournament, and I don't think uh, that's necessarily the case. But I, I think we're going to see what they're capable of against better competition once they get some better competition again. Miami is kind of a helter-skelter team, so I don't mm -hmm. really know exactly what they're capable of. Syracuse just got their blo doors blown off by UNC. Uh, Virginia got their doors blown off by NC State. Virginia Tech uh, just lost to, to Virginia uh, last night. So all four of those teams, those are the next four teams you're facing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But what we're learning about NC State right now is the fact that they do have a ton of depth in terms of the guard position. It's just kind of who's going to come on each given night. 
uh, DJ Horn. I would say arguably one of the best guards in the ACC right now, but the, he's had some off games. And when he has off games, NC State struggles. Uh, they shoot less than 30%, and that is not a winning formula in the ACC, especially not against better competition. Uh, DJ Burns has been a great offensive piece. Uh, we're learning that Ben Middlebrooks and Mo Diara, you know, if one of those guys can supplement the scoring that you're getting from DJ Burns and be great defensive players on the other end of the floor, uh, that's going to be a huge benefit for NC State. So, uh, and then we'll, we'll see, you know, there's guys like Jaden Taylor, uh, Dennis Parker Jr. that have played well, uh, but they haven't necessarily put it all together and been consistent parts of this team. So if you can get all of those guys that I was just talking about and, and maybe a Casey Morsell, you know, eventually maybe Casey Morsell starts hitting some shots. Uh, if he starts doing his thing that we know he's capable of doing, guy that led the ACC last year uh, in three-point shooting percentage, and he just hasn't done it this year. If, if all those pieces can come together, uh, we know this is a quality team. It's just how good can they be against quality competition? Corey, do you think there's a sense of pride right now in the fan base regarding this team? And what I mean by that is the way they lost to North Carolina and the way they responded in their next two games against Louisville, the madness that we saw against Wake Forest. Kevin Keats had a call to action in the postgame saying, I want more fans to show up this Saturday against Virginia Tech and more and more as they play ACC games at home. What's your feel on the fan base right now as it relates to NC State's basketball team? I think there should be a sense of pride. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily all there. Uh, this feels very reminiscent of last year where you needed to convince people and, and they slowly were able to do that. I think back to the pit game last year, the first game in ACC play, you know, they went on the road. They won. I forget exactly who it was out in the Bahamas. They beat a quality team out in the Bahamas and they come back and everybody, you know, from the fan base to, you know, the coaches and everybody's kind of making this push like, all right, everybody be at PNC Arena. Let's make this a great atmosphere. Let's, you know, the, the team is getting it together. And they lost to Pitt, who everybody at the time thought was just this terrible ACC team. And you needed to convince people again. It, that, that was kind of the feeling that you got when, you know, the UNC game was happening. It was like, all right, this team is, is getting to a point where it's good enough. You know, UNC, I'm not saying is Pitt. Uh, and I don't think that win would have been anything, you know, like it would have been against Pitt the, you know, last year. But that was the moment where, you know, the fan base had kind of bought back in. And then you saw them lose the way they did at the end of the second half. Uh, that kind of changed the minds of some people again. And you, you all of a sudden saw people on Twitter, X, whatever. You saw people on our, our, our message boards kind of going, all right, we're done on Keats again. Like, we're done with this team. We're done with this staff. Um, they're, they're building some goodwill back. It's just going to take getting to, it's going to probably take getting to eight or nine and one, uh, in ACC play and beating some of these, these teams and being on the cusp of getting to above 500 in ACC play uh, in order for people to really start buying back in. We'll see this weekend because, uh, Virginia tech, not a great team, but it's a, it's a great chance for NC state to get another quality win. Uh, if the fan base shows up, Similar to the way it did against Virginia, similar to the way it did against UNC, uh, you, you feel like this team has a chance to actually have a home court advantage again. Part of like the timeline of, of what you're talking about, that whole like, eh, let's see, let's let them prove it that, that I'm feeling from the fan base as well, uh, was also like MJ Rice isn't back yet. Cam Woods is working his way in and, and let's see what they do. Let's see how they impact. Did we overhype their impact once they're, they, they are back? Cause you know, they've, been available for now a while they haven't really been making a huge impact but they also haven't been asked to with with kind of low minutes yeah i mean i think people we were we were pretty slow to to hype them up until hey until they hit the court like I mean, when, when mj talk, rice talk. dunked on david thompson night i was like he's gonna average 30 this is it's all it's all here <laughs> well and that's part of the problem too was like they both just came out of the gate so strong. Mm -hmm. You know, MJ Rice, that was his first game. Yep. I mean, people forget, like, that was his first game, and he comes out, and he scores 11 points, and I think he had, like, four rebounds or something. You know, just strong numbers. Yep. Yeah, and, like, okay, well, all right. I mean, if this is the MJ Rice everybody's going to be getting, he's going to be really good. And now what we're seeing is a guy that's going out there, and every time he touches the floor, he's shot hunting. Like, he's not going out there and trying to play a role. He's just going out there and trying to shoot and trying to be, you know, be Casey Morsell instead of being 
MJ Rice and playing a, a role on this team that they need him to play. Uh, Cam Woods the same way. The first game he had, you know, yes, it was a loss to Tennessee, 79 to 70, but he comes out there, he plays 18 minutes, scored nine points. We've seen four points from him in eight games or in six games since. So, like, I think the part of the hype was seeing what they did once they touched the court. And it's like, all right, if this is going to be the role for this guy, then, all right, maybe, you know, he can, this this team can be that much deeper. Uh, but we just haven't seen consistent roles from them. So I think right now you're seeing the, you know, those, those uh, rotations get trimmed down a little bit. I think Keats would like to have it around seven or eight. Uh, there's a few guys that we haven't seen a role for really at all. LJ Thomas, Breon Pass, uh, you know, Ernest Ross. It sounded like Ernest Ross tried to earn a role. Uh, right before, you know, they came back from the break for ACC play, but then messed up his ankle. So I uh, don't know if you're going to even see a role for him. But there's there's a consistent rotation of like four or five, six guards, and then, you know, two or three bigs that you're really seeing for the most part uh, in this rotation. And I feel like that's kind of where Keats would like to keep it. We'll see if Cam Woods comes in this game. We'll see if this is an MJ Rice game. But other than that, it's it's going to be, you know, the same guys that you've seen. I'm leery to even ask this because I know he's the biggest fan favorite and people get mad when you when you bring up anything that's not glowing about him. Uh, but DJ Burns, how difficult is it on the, the rotation? I mean, I get so frustrated because he starts every game hot, right? It's, he gets the first touch almost every game and he hits some crafty post fadeaway and I'm like, all right, let's roll. Uh, and then before the first media timeout, he's looking to the bench and going like, I need one. Uh, how difficult is it on the rotation when, when you just can't leave him out there for long stretches and you have to kind of go from playing with the big guy in the middle to not playing with him in, in so often? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really difficult to watch because he was a guy that was able to do that for 25 minutes at the end of the stretch last year. That was part of what made NC State so successful was the fact that despite, you know, we're never going to say that he's going to be a guy that has, you know, endurance, that he's going to be able to stay out there for 35 minutes, 40 minutes a game. But he's been able to prove that he was able to play those 20 to 25 minutes and and what he was able to do offensively was huge. Also makes it difficult on the rotations because he's just not a very good defensive player. Uh, that's been one of the issues for, for NC State uh, when he's been out there. And one of the things that I think led to the turnaround win uh, again, I know I'm 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 going to tread carefully here too because again he is such a fan favorite and obviously he's a huge part of what this team is capable of of being is is what he's able to do. But you know when you look at the end of game against Wake Forest, they're able to get a ton of defensive stops and and able to you know find ways to to win enough offensively. And that was because you had two bigs on the floor. You had you know Mo Tiara and and Ben Middlebrooks out there. And what they were able to do defensively is, is stop them from getting any easy buckets. Uh, whereas, you know, DJ Burns kind of gets, you know, pushed back, get an easy bucket. He goes down the other court, other side of the court and evens it up for you. But uh, it's not always a great defensive presence. So I'd love to see him, you know, get to a point where his, his endurance is enough to be able to play those 25 minutes. But at the same time, you kind of need somebody out there to supplement the defense for him, too. Corey, I feel like up to this point, one of the main strengths of this NC State basketball team has been their ability to cause turnovers, but also protect the basketball. In recent seasons, is this more one of the, is this one of the more better NC State teams that we've seen as far as playing clean basketball on the offensive side while also aggravating on defense? Well, you know, the turnover issues have been something that have plagued them recently. Uh, they they don't normally turn the, the basketball over. I almost said football, goodness. Uh, but they don't, you know, they just don't do that uh, for the most part. They were actually number one in the country uh, in in a po- or you know offensive turnovers up until the Louisville game, and then they had like thirteen in that game, and then they had quite a few uh, the other night against Wake Forest too. So uh, that's been something they needed to clean up. But yeah, tur- forcing turnovers. Uh, the thing that you want to see from them uh, to to be able to help the offense and to be able to help kind of create more energy inside of PNC arena uh, is turning those into points. Uh, the game the other night against Wake Forest, uh, they were able to do that at times, but still, you know, points off of turnovers, 14 compared to 12 for Wake Forest. I mean, there's been time, there's been games where they've had, you know, 25 to 30 and the opponents had like eight. Uh, so that's, that's led to a huge swing in momentum for NC state. 
They've been able to find ways to get their half court offense going, but if they're able to you know, create turnovers, score off those turnovers, uh, that would be a huge boost for this team as well. Uh, Corey, we appreciate you for taking the time. One more for you uh, before we let you go. Um, should I be getting like a Paul McNeil jersey? He just scored 70, 71 in a, in a high school game. He's committed to NC State. Like, uh, do the, does the collective need to raise money? H how crazy is this guy going to be? Uh, you know, putting up 71, breaking the North Carolina high school record. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd love to say that he's, you know, one of the top shooting guards in the country. But for some reason, I got I got to get our 24-7 uh, our sports people uh, <laughs> behind this a little more, man. I, You know, I've watched this kid since he was a sophomore in high school, and he has just consistently been a shot maker. And the thing that you love to see from him here recently is getting a little more creative with the ball in his hands, too. It's not just his shooting, but he's been able to drive the basketball a little bit more. We saw it in the summer this past summer. Uh, with uh, you know, with uh, Garner Road, um, and that's something that he hadn't been able to do for the most part. Uh, and now you're seeing that that lead to just massive volume. I mean, he jumped from being third in the the uh, in North Carolina in overall scoring per game, uh, all the way up to first, passing Drake Powell, and I believe um, there was one other one that was in front of him at the time. So he's now the leading scorer in the state of North Carolina. Uh, for the season two with over 33 points per game. So yeah, you know, the, the thing for the thing for him that you love to see now is I'm not going to say he's going to be Terquavion Smith because he's not, you know, he's not that creative with the basketball. Uh, he doesn't shake people that easily, but he creates separation and he knocks down shots at a consistent rate that you could see him be, you know, the next uh, three point shooter for NC state and something that they've been waiting on uh, for quite a while, quite a little while now. Uh, so yeah, you know, there, there, there's going to have to be a significant uh, a boost in probably the you know what you're going to see from him from an NIL standpoint because the you know the the stock is is going up significantly for him. Sounds like with everything you just mentioned, we're going to have another Jalen LaCue situation in our hands. I mean, I'm just saying, Keith sometimes recruits good too good a player. No. I'm joking with NIL. I'm sure. I'm it sure can't be, be the situation. It can't be the situation for him because he's not draft eligible. So okay, uh, he's not. So, you know, the, the Josh Hall and the Jalen LeCue situations were, were what they were because of the fact that they blew up and were draft eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, he is not a reclass. Paul McNeil isn't can't go. I mean, I, I say he can't go anywhere. He isn't able to go to the NBA. So there's a chance he could go to, you know, an overtime elite or somewhere like that if they make a big offer. But it, it sounds like as of right now, uh, all signs point to him coming to NC State. And it's a place that he has loved for a very long time. That's why he committed early. That's why he signed, you know, during the early signing day, wanted to come to NC State. And every time you talk to him, he just he can't wait to get over here to play with Kevin Keats because of the creativity that he gives him. Once again, that is Corey Smith, editor of Pack Pride. Check him out on Twitter at R Corey Smith. Corey, we appreciate you. Yes, sir. Appreciate you guys.